The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, the truth is out there. Or has it already invaded Earth? Get the real story about aliens and what's really going on inside Area 51. Then... It's just exploding. A loaded gun in one hand. It was my fault. And suicidal thoughts in her mind. Why the heck would I want to live? The shocking twist that saved her life. I could do 30 days for her, then I'll kill myself. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. It's a situation that probably hadn't been seen since the Middle Ages. Rats overwhelming Los Angeles. Homeless defecating in the streets. A health emergency. And what are the people doing about it? Well, you probably don't want to hear. Ben Kennedy has discovered something shocking. Public officials are refusing to deal with this horrible epidemic. Homeless advocates say this is a crisis and are even reaching out to the White House hoping President Trump can help. What you're seeing is a row of tents. Those rows make up Skid Row, a 50 block area with the country's largest homeless population that's only continuing to grow. California is experiencing a massive spike in its rodent population. Reform California reports this rampant rat infestation has even caused the spread of dangerous diseases like typhus. Dr. Drew Pinsky calls it a health crisis, something he's not seen in this country for 100 years. He even compared downtown L.A. to a third world country because of its public health problems and lack of sanitation. Rats have overtaken the city. It's not consistent with civilization. How many must die before we change directions? Yeah. In 2019, homeless numbers in LA County rose by 12% to nearly 59,000 people. To top that, a quarter of the country's homeless population live in California. I have to respond to the systemic failures of our country in helping people like this. And it's not gonna be pretty, but it worked. Officer Dion Joseph has covered life on the skids here for 22 years, helping people like Rose who battled drug addiction for more than a decade. Thanks to people like Officer Joseph, Rose is now clean. Now I got keys to my own place. Yes. How does it feel? It feels good. You can wake up knowing you're going to wake up and everything is going to be all right. Has Rose been an inspiration to many well, to, to take the next step? Rose is an inspiration, inspiration to me. I don't know how many people she's inspired in the street, uh, but she's an inspiration to me. She's why I keep doing what I do. Now success stories like Rose are needed more than ever. Andy, would you consider this to be a crisis? It is absolute FEMA-like, Red Cross-like, National Guard-like disaster. It is an epidemic of homelessness. Reverend Andy Bales heads up Union Rescue Mission, the largest homeless shelter and recovery program in the country. Bale's dedication to helping those in need led to the loss of his leg due to a flesh-eating disease he contracted while handing out water to the homeless. After you lost your leg, did that ever deter you from getting back out there to help people? No, I actually, um, I actually missed four days of work because I had my leg taken off. What will Jesus do miraculously through us today. Without that faith, we couldn't do what we do. For many on Skid Row, the missions here are the only hope of growing out of poverty. We've been here for 25 years in the neighborhood. We've never left. Reverend Matthew Barnett's Dream Center is a Skid Row mainstay, <laughs> helping those facing abuse, addiction, and poverty. I think the goal is to try to get people out of survival mindset because people get desperate when they're trying to survive. Survival for this part of East Central LA may depend on changing laws in DC. Let's change laws and make it easier for their loved ones to gain conservatorships over them and take control of their lives so they're not in crisis or wa and walking down the streets of Skid Row. Now the LA Homeless Services Authority's report that women and children make up 40% of the homeless population. One more reason why Officer Joseph says more shelters are needed to help families, kids, and the elderly. Ben Kennedy, CBN News, Los Angeles. The biggest city in America, the biggest homeless population. Who ever heard of such a thing? 
third world country, flesh-eating bacteria. Well, in other news, America's debt level is growing to levels not seen since World War II. John Jessup has more on that. Pat, that is right. The annual deficit for fiscal 2019 had been projected to reach $896 billion. According to revised numbers by the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, it will now reach $960 billion. Next year's deficit is expected to top a trillion dollars. In the next decade, the government is forecast to add $12.2 trillion in deficits. The CBO says a recent bipartisan agreement to avoid a government default is partially to blame. That agreement lifted caps on discretionary spending over the next two years. Well, more troubling news for the economy and particularly on the jobs front. The Bureau of Labor Statistics now says 500,000 fewer jobs were created over the past year than initially thought. Early reports said the economy added about 230,000 jobs per month between March 2018 and April 2019. New information suggests the number is closer to 180,000 additional jobs per month. Those updated figures are based on state unemployment insurance records. The original data comes from surveys of hundreds of thousands of work sites, just as economists predict a recession before 2021. President Trump's latest move to curb illegal immigration is coming under fire. While it would keep families together, it would also detain them until their claims are processed. CBN's Jenna Browder has the story. The new DHS policy would effectively end the practice of catch and release. Critics say it would cause more problems than it solves. Right now we have a million, more than a million plus backlog in terms of the immigration courts. Immigration advocates question the practicality of the move. Most likely it's going to take several years. Um, and then what the government's trying to do is say all of those people who are in detention, all the families uh, who are in detention should be detained indefinitely while that process is pending. The policy announced Wednesday would end a previous rule that children detained with their families could be held for 20 days. Now families would be kept together and held until their court date. Acting DHS Secretary Kevin McAleenan defended the move and also unveiled plans for new housing with medical facilities, soccer fields, and even access to video conferencing for court proceedings. He said the old agreement basically served as an incentive for illegal entry. Human smugglers advertise and intending migrants know well that even if they cross the border illegally, arriving at our border with a child has meant that they will be released into the United States to wait for court proceedings that could take five years or more. Democrats are also blasting the change, accusing the president of wanting to punish children. This president is absolutely determined to carry out maximum cruelty with little children who are brown. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi adding in a statement, quote, the administration is seeking to codify child abuse. President Trump says congressional inaction is creating the crisis at the border. If the Democrats would meet and we could fix the loopholes and asylum, which is what you're talking about to an extent. But let me just tell you, very much I have the children on my mind. It bothers me very greatly. The president is also coming under fire for considering ending birthright citizenship, which is guaranteed in the 14th Amendment. We're looking at that very seriously, birthright citizenship where you have a baby in our land, you walk over the border, have a baby, congratulations, the baby is now a U.S. citizen. We're looking at it very, very seriously. The new rule would put more pressure on Congress to act. It would take effect in 60 days, but it already faces quite a few legal challenges, so it could take longer. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Thank you, Jenna. Pat, back to you. It's simply amazing that Congress refuses to act on this matter. This whole thing of birthright citizenship, you see, it's, quote, guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. But I'm not sure that the guarantee is exactly as stated. It's, it's, if somebody is born to a natural, uh, to an American citizen, that's one thing. But the idea is somebody sneaks across the border and has a baby, suddenly that baby is a citizen of the United States. It makes no sense whatsoever, should be changed, and these other rules should be changed. We cannot be a dumping ground for all of the poor and the needy and the dispossessed of the entire world. Uh, it'll destroy America, and any intelligent person realizes that. So something has got to be done, and done quickly. But Congress refuses to act. I think they think that these people coming in illegally and otherwise, when they give them citizenship, 
the Democrats will own them as their uh, potential uh, voting block, and they, they want that. But it's a terrible. I mean, it's bad for America, and we shouldn't be paying politics with people's lives. John? Pat, it is possibly the longest-running gospel crusade in the nation. The Southern California Harvest Crusade with Pastor Greg Laurie marks its 30th anniversary this year. It begins Friday night and includes performances from Christian artists like For King and Country, Jeremy Camp, Lecrae, and Chris Tomlin. Pastor Laurie told CBN News that it's all about sharing the gospel of Christ. It's like a feeling of celebration, almost like a big Christian party. But I don't mean to trivialize it in any way, because when the moment comes for the gospel to be preached, people are quiet. I mean, it's amazing to me to see a stadium fall silent, to hear what the Bible has to say. And the most important moment is when we extend that invitation and we see thousands of people walk down on that field to make a profession of faith to follow Christ. And starting tomorrow night, our viewers can see the services every night on the CBN News Channel platforms. That's August 23rd through the 25th at 10 p.m. Eastern. All you have to do is go to CBNNews.com to find out how and where you can watch. And Pat Pastor Lori says 500,000 people, half a million people, have come to Christ through his crusades over the past 30 years. Well, our congratulations to Greg, and we wish him the very best. Terry? Well, much more to come on today's program. Are we alone in the universe? And are the feds covering up the real truth? One astronomer's stunning discovery. And then also on the show, a young woman who wanted to kill herself ever since she was just nine years old. Then one day she grabs a gun and watch her dramatic decision. It's all happening when we come back. Well, did a spacecraft crash in Area 51? Some people think so. Are there little green men out there? Are we being visited by aliens from outer space? Is it, can E.T. call home? Well, people want answers. A tiny Nevada town is bracing for a different an invasion of millions on social media who say they'll storm Area 51 because the government is telling people to stay away, while others want to know what they're trying to hide. Many people wonder about the existence of UFOs and aliens. Some even speculate that the government knows about them and is hiding information. The question still remains, is there life on other planets? Dr. Hugh Ross is an astrophysicist who believes in God. You have to have a just right star where the planet's a certain distance from that star. The planet has to be a particular size. Dr. Ross has examined the farthest reaches of the universe and offers his ideas about life on other planets that are scientific and biblically based. Well, Dr. Hugh Ross is here. He's written a book called, quote, Lights in the Sky and Little Green Men. Dr. Ross, is so good to see you. How come you're into this stuff? Well, it all began when I was 16. I was uh, organizing the Astronomy Club in Vancouver, Canada uh -huh. to have a booth at the Pacific National Exhibition, and they put us right next to the Flying Saucer Club. So without any intention, I wound up becoming, quote, an expert in UFOs because people would talk to them and say, what do you think? <laughs> and every university where I served at, I processed the UFO reports. Well, what are they? Is there any uh, life out there? Or is this all this just fiction? Well, I mean, we are aware as astronomers that there could be as many as a trillion, trillion planets in the universe. Uh -huh. And uh, they've now discovered and measured over 4,100 planets beyond the solar system. But what's interesting is that none of them are like any of the planets in our solar system, mm -hmm. which led to the interesting discovery every one of the eight planets plays a critical role in making advanced life possible here on Earth. So while many astronomers think maybe we can find microbes on other planets, the idea that we're going to find life like us, I mean, that we now know that that's an extremely remote possibility. Well, you know, your book about our incredible planet is so moving because you go into detail about all the wonderful things that we have on Earth that other planets don't have. 
to support life. It's, an, it's unbelievable. You, you, your studies in that is, is so f much uh, well, faithful. Well, a lot of my peers focus on the water habitable zone, the liquid yeah. water habitable zone, but there are 12 other known habitable zones. And for a planet to be truly habitable, it must simultaneously reside in all 13 of those zones. Mm -hmm. And there's only one planet that we've seen in the entire universe that does reside in all those zones. And I'll let you and your viewers guess which one that is. <laughs> well, you've gone into detail, though, in this book about, about all the people who believe in Area 51, about little space invaders of strange uh, people with big heads and weak bodies and, and E.T. calling home and so forth. Well, how has this spread so widely in our society? Well, millions of people claim to have had encounters with UFOs. And the vast majority you can explain as simply natural phenomena or human activity or a hoax. But there's a 1% residual that actually you can show is real, but not physical. Now, I had Carl Sagan as a professor briefly when I was at the University of Toronto, and he denied UFOs totally. That's because his worldview did not permit the existence of non-physical reality. As a Christian, I realized God created two different species of intelligent beings, humans that are physical and real, mm -hmm. and angels yeah. that are real but not physical. And when you examine this 1% residual of the UFO sightings, you see that they consistently violate the laws of physics, but nevertheless, you can prove they're real. For example, there are literally hundreds of places where UFOs are crashed into the ground. You go to the site, the ground is depressed, vegetation is damaged, snow is melted if there's snow that's there. Uh, obviously, something real happened there but there's no debris, there's no artifacts. And when the UFO is observed coming through the atmosphere, let's say 18 to 25,000 miles per hour, no sonic boom, no heat friction. If it was a physical object, you would get a sonic boom and heat friction, and there'd be debris at the crash site. So we're dealing with something that obviously is real, but it's not physical. And I'm not the only physicist that's saying this. Uh, I know of a half dozen other physicists and astronomers who are not believers who draw the same conclusion that I do, that whatever is behind the occult and witchcraft and demonology is also behind this residual of the UFO encounter. The residual? What do angels do? What, what do you think? Why isn't there some evidence of their, of their presence? Well, because um, I mean, there is evidence. Mm. I'm saying that there's clear evidence that something real is happening. Uh, and there's evidence that it's not physical. They violate the laws of physics, so it's non-physical reality. Jacques Vallée, who is not a believing uh, UFO investigator, says it's interdimensional phenomena. He believes there are beings operating in dimensions beyond the universe which is very compatible with what the Bible says about angels and demons. Tell me about what would an angel do? I mean, uh, you know, you mentioned the incredible distances between planets. How do angels travel between them? Well, they're not subject to the laws of physics. Mm -hmm. So things like the velocity of light aren't a problem for them, or the fact that there's particles in interstellar space that would destroy your spaceship. We know these can't be physical craft coming to the Earth because... Uh, they would have to travel so far, and uh, if they were to travel at a high velocity, uh, the beings on board would be killed. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're dealing with something that's not subject to these laws of physics, and angels fit into that category. The other thing that's interesting is the closer the encounter that people have with UFOs, yes. it's 100% deleterious. Nobody has a positive experience. And which is why I believe it's the fallen angels that are responsible for this phenomena. And I think what I write about in the book mm -hmm. is that you see a correlation between the degree of occult activity in yes. an individual's life and their UFO experiences. And I end the book by saying this is scientifically testable. Close the doors to occult activity. That will be the end of these UFO experiences. The reverse is also true. If you open up these occult things, uh, don't be surprised if you get these kinds of visits, and it's not going to be pleasant. 
Well, so these are fallen angels? I mean, they're demonic spirits that are causing this phenomenon? Is it? I'm convinced that they're demonic. And again, I'm not alone in drawing this conclusion amongst scientists who've studied this phenomenon. I think what's unique to us is that we're putting a Christian perspective on it and saying, you know, here's how you can put it to the test scientifically. So I actually say these are ways you open up doors to the occult. It also explains why, for example, uh, you know, I've spoken UFOs frequently uh, in the Soviet era in Russia. And uh, that's when the scientific community was involved in occult physics. And that opened up the doors for these demons to influence and explains why they're having way more UFO experiences than people here in America. Well, they, these people talk about being captured and taken into a spacecraft and carried into other places. Are, are demon spirits doing that actually, you think? Yeah, I don't think they're actually being physically taken into a physical craft. Okay. It's the demons taking control of them where they begin to think that this is what's happened to them. That's why we have a chapter in the book on abductions. Uh -huh. and, uh, but abductees are people who typically have had very close encounters with UFOs. It was a physicist, Alan Hynek, who was sponsored by the U.S. government to study UFOs, mm -hmm. who came up with encounters of the first kind, second kind, third kind, fourth kind. And as you go from one to four, you're having a closer and closer encounter. And in cases of communications of uh, three and four, people are actually communicating with these spirit beings. So, for example, uh, there is the Urantia book, which was communicated by these uh, demons. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was done through automatic writing, 4,000-page book. A third of it is denying the deity of Jesus Christ. So it kind of gives you an idea of who's really behind so, all this. So these demons are actually causing people to have delusions. They think they're being taken captive. They think, and there's always some uh, evil at the end of it. There's right, uh, but there's a way out. Yeah, okay. Close the doors to the occult. That'll eliminate these experiences. These demons need permission to invade your life. Mm. And uh, that's you know, a lot of what's going on. And the other thing I point out is this is not a new phenomenon. It's been around for thousands of years. But the demons keep pace with our technology. Yeah. UFOs 100 years ago were slow-moving dirigibles in the atmosphere. Mm-hmm. Uh, now they're flying saucers at uh, 18,000 miles per hour. Um, and then the, the information they give you about the universe is keeping pace. But this, this is incredible. The, 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 the demons are actually keeping pace with our science and, and bringing these, these uh, delusions to people. Uh, well, that would be a good strategy for the demons who are intent on deceiving us about what's really going on in the spirit realm. Mm -hmm. And so it makes sense uh, from their perspective that they would keep pace with our technology. Well, do the good angels uh, have a counterbalancing uh, uh, force? Well, it tells you in Hebrews 13, too, that many have entertained the good angels unawares. Yes. Uh, God sends these uh, righteous angels to assist uh, humans in their Christian ministry. And uh, they come and go. Uh, but likewise, they're also part of this non-physical reality, but they're on God's side as opposed to Satan's side. Well, you remember when they went into the Promised Land, the, the Joshua, uh, you know, found the, the, the army of the Lord was there with him, and he, that was angelic. So that was you, angelic. They're, yeah, as I said, God created two different species of intelligent beings. Incredible, incredible. Well, let me ask you, uh, in terms of, you know, I know they've got something they put out called creation science, and uh, you, you have done such a marvelous job of showing to the Christian uh, population the uh, truth of, of the origins of life and the beginning of our universe. Uh, what are we looking at? Is it 14, 15 billion years? Is that about the... the, the... Well, the age of the universe has uh, been measured to be 13.8 billion years. 13.8. And we actually have telescopes where we can look far enough back in time that we're actually watching Mm -hmm. uh, the universe being created literally within a hundred billionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second of the cosmic creation event. Incredible. Explains why we astronomers are coming forth with such compelling scientific evidence uh, for the God of the Bible and the Christian faith, because we can directly observe events in the past. 
Well, yeah. is the Big Bang the whole thing? I mean, there apparently was a, a tiny, was there any matter, the tiny bit that was compressed, then it exploded and became the universe that we know of? Well, the universe, when it was created, was an infinitesimal volume. But God created it dynamically, where it was expanding right from the cosmic creation event mm -hmm. and continues to expand to this day. But one of the compelling evidence is that there's a supernatural being designing it. It's expanding at exactly the right rate, at exactly the right time throughout all of cosmic history to make advanced life possible on one planet. I mean, what's behind the UFO thing is the idea there's all these planets with intelligent beings on it. And uh, we now know a couple of papers just got published making the point, if there is intelligent life in the universe, it's got to come after us because it takes a minimum of 13.8 billion years to prepare the universe for advanced life. So we have to be the first of the physical intelligent it took beings. The, the entire universe, that was your premise, and I think it's so right. fascinating, that this enormous universe was, was, was designed to have life here on this one planet, and, and we're the uh, uh, epicenter. You literally need the whole universe to be exactly the size that it is and the age that it is with all the matter and energy that's in it to get one planet on which advanced life is possible. The whole universe exists to make our existence possible. You know, <laughs> that's an overwhelming statement. And so well, <laughs> it tells you how much God must care and love for us that yeah. he was prepared to create all this stuff to make our existence possible. So we're pretty special. So, you know, I was reading and Paul talking about that the church uh, to show the principalities and powers, the wisdom of God, that, that he was centered in the church. So the Christian people are pretty important, then, aren't they? They are. And we humans are very important. And the redemptive message that, or, that God is trying to achieve is crucial. I'm writing books now making the point that every event in the universe, Earth and Earth's life, and every component of the universe, Earth and Earth's life, was designed to play a role to make possible the redemption of billions of human beings from sin and evil. I believe the whole universe was created with a fundamental purpose in mind. That the holy, that, that we are the center of the, so what we do is extremely important. Winning people to Jesus is a, is a, is a huge thing then in the cosmos. It is, yeah. The cosmos was designed for evangelism, to put it bluntly. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's good news for all, all of us who are trying to win people to the Lord. But, well, that's why I'm so passionate about bringing people to faith in Christ. Sure. Just looking at the universe and realizing it was designed for that very purpose. Where do you see the end of it? Did, did, did you, is there any forecasting of how long it's going to go on? There is in the sense that we realize that it took this minimum time to open up a narrow window in which we humans could exist in a civilized state. We knew that the window opened up less than 100,000 years ago, and it's going to close in less than 100,000 years. Uh, and some think that it's going to close within thousands of years or less. So, yeah, we're nearing the end of the window of time. Well, it, will it burn with fervent heat? Is that the idea? That is, I mean, it, the, the whole thing? Well, it tells us that in Isaiah and Second yeah. Peter, that the end of the universe, it'll be rolled up like a scroll and end in a fiery heat. And there are actually uh, Big Bang creation models that predict that very thing. The, the, the come, come back to that, the, the, the one day that... What, what is, does the sun explode? I mean, as far as we're concerned, what, what happens? Well, if you wait long enough, uh, the sun will get so bright that it'll incinerate the earth. But that's a good four billion years away. I, I'm, I'm so. not sure I'm going to be that old. <laughs> right. But th this is fascinating. And I appreciate the work you do. And, the, and that, that book on the incredible planet, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't got a copy, you ought to get it. It'll, it'll, it'll build your faith like nothing you've ever seen. And this is interesting, lights in the sky, little green man. Uh, is this Pat, if people are interested in that, we're actually offering a free chapter at uh, reasons.org slash 700. Oh, oh That's the place uh, a get free the chapter, reason. Uh, so if they want to see what the book is about, and we give them a little taste Thank of that. You. Dr. Ross, you, you're a treasure, and you're going to be lecturing to our, our, our faculty at Regent. For, be doing that tomorrow. Well, yeah. It'll be wonderful. I look forward to it. Well, thank you so much. Hugh Ross, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to have your faith built about what great God we serve, this is the guy that will tell you about it. Terry. 
Well, still to come on today's show, forecasters weigh in on hurricane season. Are we in the calm before the storm? Plus, your questions and some honest answers. Pat weighs in on the issues that matter to you. And also, haunted by suicidal thoughts, a troubled woman vows to end it all. Watch what happens right when she's about to pull the trigger. That is next. Welcome back for the CBN News Break. Well, we're just over a month into hurricane season, and so far, so good. The Atlantic Ocean has remained fairly calm. Experts say it has been the calmest season in more than 35 years, although the first named storm, Tropical Storm Chantel, forming in the Atlantic this week. The last time the U.S. went this far into the season before seeing a named storm in the Atlantic was back in 1982. And while the latest hurricane forecasts predict relative calm for the rest of the month, it most likely won't last. AccuWeather says August 20th through September 11th typically, typically marks a big increase in tropical activity. Well, President Trump is freeing disabled vets from student loans, signing an executive order for all U.S. veterans who are permanently disabled. It also exempts them from having to pay federal income tax on those loans. Many disabled vets already qualify for a program to get loan forgiveness, but haven't tried because the process is said to be time-consuming and complicated. The president's order directs the government to create a simpler process with, quote, minimal burdens. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Like many other nine-year-old girls, Eli played with dolls, but she wasn't hosting tea parties. She was play-acting their suicides. For years, Eli wanted to end it all, and one day she had a plan to do just that. I had my storage key, and I sometimes would just clinch it because I didn't know if I was going to make it that day. The key Eli Goodenough held so closely would open the door to the ultimate escape because behind it was a loaded gun. Why the heck would I want to live? I always internalized everything, so not only was I in complete torment all the time, but it was my fault, and I'm never going to get it together. From a young age, Eli was sexually abused by someone she knew, but she blamed herself. And by age nine, she was battling thoughts of suicide. Even just playing with my dolls, having them kill themselves or go through abuse. I had a lot of secrets. I just had to grow up holding all that in. By her teens, she was cutting, addicted to drugs, and was hospitalized multiple times for anorexia. It was like the inside of me was just always screaming, and I never had relief. It was constant agony. Then at 16, she seemed to be turning a corner through counseling until her mother died unexpectedly in her sleep. Everyone was so worried about me dying. She just died. And so I, I, I got left with all these things I didn't get to say. Just regret, all consuming regret and shame. I didn't know how to handle it. After high school, she moved to LA and was doing whatever she could to get drugs. Trying to get help, she tried rehab several times, but always relapsed, unable to find peace. I was always tense. It's like if someone took a shotgun and just blew a hole through me, trying to stop bleeding, just this unrest. I just couldn't even imagine living any longer. So she got a gun and put it in a storage unit, waiting for the day she had the courage to turn it on herself. But as much as she wanted to die, she knew what it would do to her family. Living was actually harder than killing myself. I was constantly living just so I didn't hurt other people, but it was never for me. In her decade-long cycle of addiction and suicidal thoughts, Eli also contracted HIV. It just left me completely baffled and feeling even more 
hopeless. Then in 2012, Eli had a flashback to her childhood trauma, followed by a seizure. My body can't stuff one more thing. It is just exploding, like I'm done. The loaded gun called to her. So with the key in hand, she went to her storage unit. But something stopped her. If you're really gonna do this right, you should go back, see your family, get some closure, really for them. Looking sickly and gaunt, she went to visit her dad and his girlfriend, Debbie, who begged her to go to rehab. She was just weeping for me, and it was, it was just profound, and so I agreed. I was like, man, okay, I could do 30 days for her, then I'll kill myself. So they took her to Captive Hearts, a Christian rehab home. There, Eli saw a familiar face. It was Chaplain Judy Bowen a counselor she met 10 years before. I said, Eli? And she looked at me and her face lit up and she said, Chaplain Judy? And I said, I thought you were dead. They'd met during Eli's first attempt at rehab, but Eli had bolted after only a few weeks, leaving behind a rumor that she'd committed suicide. Judy had thought about her often. Was I able to say enough about trying to lead her to Jesus that it made an impact that she could cry out to God? I didn't know. Now, Judy had a second chance, but it was clear Eli didn't want to be there. So broken, so angry. Eli was to the point of self-destruction. We were the last hope. So Judy and some other counselors took Eli to a prayer service at the healing rooms in Santa Maria. The pastor had a random word and just began to cry. He said, somebody here has been in such a dark place and the Lord is telling me he's healing you right now. Don't take your life. That word opened the door. I never felt so free and loved in my life. I just accepted Jesus. I completely surrendered to him fully. God didn't care about any of it. My problems, like, it, just, it didn't even matter. Eli recovered from addiction and would no longer be haunted by suicidal thoughts. She says God also healed her of HIV. I always tell people God is a show off and he completely blew my mind. What had been a tombstone for Eli turned into a stepping stone for her future. It just showed me what he can do for every one of us if we allow him to do the work. Through Eli's testimony, her bond with her family members has strengthened and they have come to know more of Jesus Christ. Eli is now married with two children and as a musician and writer, she points others to Jesus. Every lie the enemies told you, it's shameful. You're not good enough. You should die. All those horrible things, it's because you have a destiny. If you're still alive. You're a miracle. And you just have to reach out to God. And He loves you. And there's, it's not a mistake. You're watching this right now. Um, this is exactly for you. It is for you because God wants you to know you have a destiny. He clearly says it in His words. In his word, he says, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. There was Eli stuck in the midst of all these things that had gone on in her life, gone on around her, beset by voices in her own head and heart that were telling her she was worthless, that life was meaningless, that there was no hope, that there was no future for her even encouraging her to end her life, to take the gift that God had given and end it. You know, we talked a few minutes ago on this program about demonic activity. The Bible says your enemy, who is also God's enemy, comes around you like a, a hungry lion ready to devour you. Listen, be smart enough to know that. These voices, this, this despair, this anger, is not just something you've conjured up inside of you. It's steaming all around us. And that's why the Bible also says, choose you this day 
who you will serve. Who will you serve? Will you entertain those thoughts? Will you let them in? Because you can stop it. You can choose to stop it right now. And that's why Eli's story is so important. If you're experiencing that kind of, of depression, that kind of, of lack of, of uh, forgiveness, that kind of anger and animosity, that kind of hopelessness, God wants to change all of that for you right now. Listen, God created you with a plan and a purpose in mind. He even says that he created us in his own image and likeness. And all of this, everything that's wonderful, everything that's amazing about his creation is because he loves you so much. Listen, you can get rid of one and grab hold of the other today. It's a choice. You make the choice, but once he comes in, it's his power that heals. It's his power that gives you the courage and the strength to forgive. It's his power that replaces your anger with a love that Eli described as indescribable. It changes you. Would you do that today? Would you give Jesus Christ the same opportunity you've given everything else in your life? Let's do it together right now. I'd love to do it with you. I'd love to lead you in that prayer. It is so simple. Come to your father today, not an earthly father who has failures and shortcomings, but a heavenly father who has known you from before you were formed in your mother's womb. Let's pray together. Jesus, I am so broken. I am so needy. I'm empty. I have nothing more to give. I have desperate, desperate need to be free from this. Today, I'm choosing you. I'm letting go of past history, people who have wounded and hurt me, disappointed me, not been there for me. I'm letting go of behaviors I have clung to that have defined me. I want to be defined by you. I want to be defined by you, the one true God who knew me before I was formed in my mother's womb, who created me with purpose and intention, who knows my sins and my shortcomings and my failures and forgives me, forgetting all of it as far as the East is from the West. Today, be my God. Today, become the Lord of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Teach me your ways, God. Change the way I think. Open my ears to hear you when you speak to me. Open my eyes to the beauty of what you've created around me. Open my heart to the possibility of all that life with you offers. I give you all of it today, Lord, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I'm asking you to make me yours. I want to live for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Listen, if you've prayed that prayer, you've begun an incredible journey. We've got some information we'd like to send to you because what do you do now? You've prayed the prayer. How do you grow? Well, we have a packet that Pat's put together for you. It's called A New Day, and it's yours for the asking. Our number is even toll free. It couldn't be simpler. It's 1-800-700-7000. You just call and say, I just prayed that prayer with that lady on TV, and I'd like the New Day packet. We will send it out to you absolutely free of charge. So please call now. You've begun a great adventure. Well, up next, we've got questions from all of you and some honest answers. Sharon says, I win large sums of money gambling occasionally. Should I tithe on those winnings? We're going to tackle that and more, and it's all coming up. Well, we have your questions, and Pat has some honest answers, so let's get started on email today. Pat, this first one comes from Sharon, who says, Occasionally, I win large sums of money gambling. Is it wrong to tie the portion of those winnings? Well, you know, You're good to give it all, right? I'll <laughs> tell you a little story. When I was first sort of coming to the Lord, I was in law school, and uh, I, I decided that I would uh, uh, take the amount that I was spending on uh, Saturday night, and I'd put it uh, in the collection plate on Sunday morning, and uh, 
then I decided that I'd make it tough for myself, so I doubled the amount I spent on Saturday night. And next thing I know, I was the, probably one of the biggest donors in the church, and the <laughs> preacher came to visit me to uh, say, who is this guy who's given us all this money? Well, anyhow, uh, I, I can't see anything wrong with that. If, if, if you're winning money and you want to tie it to the Lord, well, God bless you. Well, why not? Uh, you know, the, the thing is, is uh, you know, you, you don't get to take your, your losses out of the collection plate and pay yourself back. Just keep that in mind. <laughs> but uh, God looks at you where you are, and he, he loves you. And if you're like a little child walking, you don't get mad at a little kid because he falls down every so often. So, um, so you're out gambling, and you're winning money, and you want to tie it to the Lord. Well, by all means, do it. All right? This is Julie who says, Hebrews 5, 9 says, And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. And Matthew 6, 15 says, But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Are obedience and a willingness to forgive others requirements to go to heaven? Oh, uh, look, in order to be born again, uh, you have to be in a condition where you're willing to forgive. And in order to be born again, you have to be, you know, uh, like the Lord. And so if you won't forgive others, you know, for, I, you know that's the Lord's prayer. Uh, you know, I, I forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Um, I, I believe it's, it's, it's integral to being born again is to have a forgiving spirit. And if you hold grudges in your heart, it's going to be very hard for you to be in a condition of being born again because, you know, you have to forgive. So if you're asking me, I, I think whatever you're doing, if you're holding a grudge against somebody, you know, I, I'm in a position right now, I can't hold a grudge against somebody to save myself. I really can't do it. I'd, I'd like to sometimes, but I can't. I, I just can't do it. And I, I think in relation to you, uh, the same thing is true. The Lord makes it very clear. So if you're harboring resentment in your heart towards somebody and you refuse to forgive, you're on dangerous territory. So you ask me about going to heaven and so forth. That's in God's hands. But I'll say, if I were you, whatever it is, I mean, whoever hurts you, your father hurts you, your mother hurts you, your professor hurts you, your employer hurts you, whoever it is, forgive that your heavenly Father might forgive you, all right? Okay, this is Brianna who says, Romans 12, 15 says, Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. What does that mean? Well, what it means very simply is, is share, have empathy. You know, if you're dealing with other people and you're, you want to love the Lord, you've got to uh, enter into the situation of people around you. And if people are crying, you need to share their grief. If people are rejoicing, you want to rejoice with them. And you don't say, well, I, I'm envious because he's happy and I, I, I'm, I'm sad. You know, but sh have empathy is what it says. And I think that's a good word for any Christian. This is Linda Pat who says, I watch the 700 Club every day. I have never heard you talk about if it's okay to watch soap operas as a Christian. There are two that I watch every day. I'm sick and cannot work, so TV has become my friend. I have heard several different answers on the subject and don't know what to believe anymore. What are your thoughts? Well, again, uh, it's drama. And, you know, I, I, I once upon a time wanted to have a soap opera channel for for well, the family channel, so I, I can hardly say that it's sinful to watch soap operas. But um, uh, if, if the, the trouble is some, some women, for example, they watch some mean so-and-so in a soap opera, and then they identify their husband with that mean so-and-so, and so when he, the poor guy comes home, they've got that attitude to him, like, hey, how could you be so mean? <laughs> and he, I haven't been mean. Well, that guy on the camera it was. So be careful when you watch those things that you don't identify with the characters because it's fictional. And it, it, you have to remember that, all right? Linda, Lydia says, I have a question, Pat. Uh, you said that we will have assignments in heaven. I don't want any assignments. I just want to bask in God's love, lay on the beach, swim, eat fruit, or some equivalent of that. What's up with that? 
I hate to tell you, you're out of your mind. Uh, I tell you, about two or three days of that, and I'd go out of my, my gourd. I've got to be active and pursue things. I mean, let's face it, I'm crowding 90 years old, and I'm still here on the television. I'm running a university and, doing the, and writing books. You know, you, we have to be active. And the idea that you have useful employment, it's the bad things that make life hard. But there's so much good that we can do and you should be challenged. The idea of lying on a beach the rest of your life and sitting in a rocking chair, you're out of your mind. Don't think of that. It's horrible. We leave you with this power from Joshua. Be strong and have a good courage, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. For all of us, this is Pat Robertson. See you later. Bye-bye.